Well, thank you everybody for joining us. I'm Father Chris, one of the Miriam priests here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. And we are honored that you are with us as we continue our series of, of talks on Saturdays called Explaining the Faith. And this is a very, very interesting topic for a couple of reasons. Um, number one is I always enjoy taking you guys back to seminary. I saved all my notes, I saved all my books. But I went to seminary 10 years ago and there wasn't a whole lot of talk then about our topic today, which is what is woke and isn't it Christian? It sounds very Christian. And we're going to be talking about that today and um, excited. Now, however, although I didn't learn a lot in seminary, I've done so much research on this. And I thank you, our theologians, Chris Sparks. I had help from some of our employees, Jackie and others. And I've been talking to other priests. In fact, I even found a seminarian, a diocesan seminarian last week, and he shared with me tons of stuff that they are talking about in their seminary. He's a seminarian currently. And so we're gonna share all this with you. And let's entrust it to God, and let us begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask that you send St. Michael down to protect us against the evil, the evil of trying to thwart your church and your work of mercy. We ask that the evil one be held at bay, that this message of mercy be given to the world. Mother Mary, you wrap your mantle around us, and Jesus, we trust in you. And we offer all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so as we said today, the topic is going to be what is woke. Now, I, I was telling the group here at the shrine before I started that before I begin, I'd like to announce, and I've mentioned this a couple times, but we have a new platform, and I think it's timely now because... After this talk, I hope I'm still around, but we, we, we hope and pray, but if not, you can find all of our videos on divinemercyplus.org. And I'm sorry, I should have made a slide for it, but it's real easy, one word, P-L-U-S is spelled out, divinemercyplus.org, and we have all of our videos up there. So we pray we don't get canceled, but this is such a topic, you never know what's gonna happen. And I'm going to give you some real hard facts, we're gonna give you church teaching, but it's not gonna be happy for everybody, and the truth never is. And so we invite you to stay with us. Now, I did say this before too, after this talk, um, a couple things, first of all, if I disappear, I did not run off with some woman because I love my priesthood more than any person. I, I am in no way ever gonna run away and disappear. So if I do, you'll know something happened. Secondly, if they find me deceased, I did not commit suicide, okay? I, I did not. I, I am so in love with this ministry, with God's church, and this is what I am called to do unquestionably, but I know it doesn't make everybody happy, so be it. I still defend the truth of the teachings of the church. And finally, if there's a false accusation, I can promise you the last thing in this world I would ever do is abuse a child. I'd rather die. So if any of those happen, God's will be done, but we pray, and if your prayers help protect us here at the Marian Fathers, we'll be okay. And so today's topic is this controversial. It is, it, people have been writing me for, for a couple years now asking me to please address this. And so I had to make sure that we did this in the right way. Now today we're going to be talking, and I apologize, I wanted to cover it all today. I realized last night at two in the morning I can't do this. I'm gonna do the first part today, which is what is woke um, and what does it do? And then on following talks, right after, I'm gonna be talking about pride, I'm gonna be talking about transgenderism, all this in light of church teaching. Um, then woke, the elements of it, critical race theory, Black Lives Matter, defunding the police, anti-patriotism, removal of God, climate change, cancel culture, 
EFI, equality, uh, diversity, equality, and inclusion. Now remember, we're giving this in terms of church teaching. Now, before I begin, it's important to say though, no matter what, that the end goal, I think, of the woke movement is good. Nobody wants to tolerate racism, for example. Um, there are people who are discriminated against. We're, we're not doubting that. We're not trying to justify that. We never will. But the means don't justify the end sometimes. Okay, and um, the same thing with people struggling with gender. The catechism is very clear. We are called to love them, not condemn them. And no way, shape, or form is anything I'm going to say in these next few Saturdays ever to be taken that we're criticizing or condemning or attacking a person. That is not Christ. That is not Christ. What it is is to see the truth in reality. We must empathize with them, but the best way to love somebody is to show them the truth lovingly, not to lie to them. And so that's what we're going to attempt to do. Remember, love the sinner, hate the sin. Well, Father, stop being political. You've heard me say this before. This is part of something in Catholic teaching that we're going to be talking about called social justice. This is not um, politics. It's, it's, it's social justice, an important part of church teaching. So basically, this is important. Now, before I begin, some of the people who I know undoubtedly will accuse me. I'm going to start with something. All of what I give you is going to be objective in church teaching except the first part. The first part here, I've been reading so much researching so much, praying so much, that I want to share with you something that came to me prayer in prayer yesterday. And I wrote it down. I'm going to read it to you. This is the only part of this whole series that is going to be my opinion, even though I agree with church teaching on everything. This is something that I want to share that I think is very, very important. People are going to say, Father, stop getting into conspiracy theories. No, I've never been one for conspiracy theory. But then I saw somebody, a good Catholic, that says, you know why we Catholics sometimes follow conspiracy theories? Because we believe in an enemy we cannot see. And when you teach against an enemy you can't see, you're going to be called a conspiracy theorist. And so what I'm about to share with you, you may call that, this is the only part that has come to me in prayer of my opinion, then everything else you listen to and tell me if you agree with this or not. You don't have to say it out loud, but just in your hearts, because this is important. What came to me in prayer is this. Obviously, the ends aren't always justified by the means, as I said earlier. There is good in this movement in the sense justice helping those who are uh, discriminated against or racism or something, or even helping those who are confused by their gender, um, who are truly trying to help the climate. I'm an environmentalist. I love to hunt and fish. I want there to be animals around. Um, in some part, I, I agree and unite with this movement. However, the way that it's done, and the final objective, or agenda, if you will, is what we have to talk about. Here's what I wrote, and I'd like to share with you, um, is this. <clears throat> what do I believe? Now, this is not church teaching. You do not have to follow. This is just after years of research, prayer. This is my conclusion. The woke movement of global elitists has put into motion an unprecedented attack against Western civilization and the Catholic Church that built it. Their hatred for the West and the Church is undeniable. And it exists because those two are the only remaining obstacles to a new world order. Why? 
because in the West, we have freedom. And with freedom, there is not full control of the people. Marxism has resurfaced because of its ability to control the masses. China was chosen by the global elites to lead the world because they have the perfect model for controlling the people. Also, depopulization. Depopulation is a key motivator for the globalists because that also controls the masses. That is why we see such a push for abortion, contraception, transgenderism, gay marriage, and in some ways, the vaccine with its effects of sterility and miscarriages. These all control the population. In order for a one world government, which is scriptural, by the way, everything I'm actually led to in my formulation of this is all scriptural. The Antichrist, the falling away from the faith, the attack of the church, one world government, it's, this is all scriptural. So you don't have to necessarily attack on that sense because it's in, it's in the Bible. In order for a one world government to control easier, the population must be more easily controlled. Who leads the free world? The United States of America. So it must be brought down through division. Who is the true church that built the free world? Through universities, through hospitals, through recognition of the dignity of the human person, the Catholic Church. So it must be brought down, and its teachings of objective moral truth must be dismantled. With the church, people submit to God and not the state. In Marxism and the New World Order, people must submit to the state, not to God. Thus, the church has to be removed. And the fabric that holds both of these together, Western civilization and the church, is the family. That is why Lucy, Sister Lucy said Satan's final attack would be on marriage and the family. To achieve this global objective of depopulization and control of the masses, you have to defeat the church and the greatest nation defending freedom in order to have a new government. The church is the last standing institution that fully holds life sacred by standing against abortion, birth control, gay marriage, transgenderism, etc. And again, you must defeat America, the mightiest bastion of true freedom that gives every person a voice. Thus, this agenda may be more dangerous than many of us think. Please pray. And please pray for me. Because this is something that I'm saying right now that might get me in trouble. But I feel the truth has to be spoken. And I ask for your prayers. And most of all, please pray for the church. She's the last one standing that is trying to convince the world of the truth. As Jesus said, you're either for me or against me. If you stand with the church, you stand with Christ. If you tear down the church, you tear down Christ. You never can tear him down, but at least in your own life you will. And so with that, let us begin now an objective view of what, that's my personal view, as I said, that is not church teaching. Is congruent with the gospel, but you are to form your own opinion, but you are to use church teaching to guide you. Now I'm going to give you what is the facts. Let's start with our next slide. And I'm sorry, I missed the first slide was a picture there of diversity, equity, 
and inclusion, which is the buzzwords today. Let's go to our next slide. What is woke? This is our <clears throat> third slide. What is woke? Woke, interesting. Today, it's a slang term for activism, especially progressive activism. Let's go to our next slide. We've seen how many of these pictures on the news, um, protests, riots, uh, peaceful, non-peaceful. We've seen this. How did it start? Where did it come from? And what's the history? You know, the word woke, where did it first begin? It actually was first printed in 1962 in a New York Times essay. Traditionally, it's meant to be conscious or aware of something. Now, the Oxford Dictionary notes that the term originally meant that you are well-informed, up to date. Now, now what does it chiefly mean today? It now means chiefly alert to racial or social discrimination and injustice, that you're aware of it. That's what we have. Wokeness today has its roots in decades of critical theory. Different than critical race theory. Critical race theory is a form of critical theory. And that all came from our universities. Originally from France. Interesting. Today, it is intertwined with cancel culture. Critical race theory and progressive activism such as protests. Let's go to our next slide. This picture really gets me because this is our White House. Do you know that that violates the law? Putting that flag equal to the United States of America flag violates the law. On our own White House, the law was violated. So we see everywhere the pride movement, woke, since schools, companies, all the way to the highest levels of government. Marion Webster, the dictionary, says woke is a slang term that came into the mainstream from a variety of dialect called the African American Vernacular English, or AAVAE for short. And basically, in this AAVE, awake is often rendered as woke, as in, I was sleeping but now I'm woke, I'm awake. Interesting, because that's how the term came from the slang. Let's go to our next slide. Then in 2013, 2014, there was a tragedy. After George Zimmerman in Florida was acquitted of Trayvon Martin's death, and then the police involved death of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, a wave of BLM activism emerged. I'm not here to debate the justice of that legal decision or the innocence or guilt of George Zimmerman. What we're here is to talk about what happened. And the phrase woke went from a Twitter hashtag to a rallying cry. Marion Webster said the word woke became entwined with the BLM movement. Instead of just being a word that signaled awareness, I'm awake or I'm woke, instead of just signaling an awareness of injustice or racial tension, it became a word of action. And sometimes that action became unpeaceful. It said activists we're now woke and called on others to stay woke. Let's go to our next slide. Then in 2018, a rapper by the name of Meek Mill used the phrase woke in his album, Legends of the Summer. Now back to Marion Webster, they said after that song, stay woke became a watchword in parts of the black community for those who were self-aware, questioning the dominant paradigm and striving for something better. But now, why then is it dominating our schools, our companies, and even our government? Okay, 
Let's get into this. What is woke? Now, I'm going to quote here from Bishop Barron. I know a lot of you don't agree with some of his teaching. I'm not here to debate his view on universalism. Um, I don't necessarily agree with what he teaches on universalism, but what he's saying here is applicable to the topic. And I think it's very good. So Bishop Barron here in an article, Why the Catholic Church Cannot Stay Woke or Stay Quiet, is what I want to refer to. Now it starts with St. Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas said, God is intimately present to all of creation and to every aspect of life, very much including the social and political order. Yes, we are as Catholics to be involved in politics. It's important, it's social justice. Bishop Barron said, we ought to therefore never think of economics and politics as secular if by that term we mean divorced from God and God's purposes. We must, as Catholics, be involved in economics and politics. So please hold those letters. <laughs> Long before the European powers moved to end slavery, the church was involved in the politics and condemned it. If we were not supposed to be involved in politics, the church would have never condemned slavery. We have to condemn what is unjust. The woke movement has entered into our culture, and the church needs to be there too in the culture. Very important. So let's watch a quick video. It's only one minute of Father or Bishop Beeren defining what woke is. You, you mentioned the, this uh, kind of woke movement and some of the characteristics of it from my uh, you know perspective uh, seem to view things or uh, people as either being oppressed or oppressors. So you're, right. you're in one category or the other category. Right. Is, does, this, does this kind of current woke movement, which is uh, quite different in my, for, from my perspective, again, for, from classic, classical liberalism, or what right. you know, liberals might have been in the 1960s. Um, does this have its roots in, in Marxism? Yeah, and other thinkers too, but Marx is one of them. I, I've identified Marx, Nietzsche, Sartre, and Michel Foucault as some of the major players in the formation of the woke mentality. And I think you're absolutely right the way you put it there is the tendency to see human beings through this one lens, the lens of power. So who has it, who doesn't have it? The lens of the oppressor and the oppressed put it in Hegel's terms, and Marx was deeply Hegelian, the master-slave dynamic. Who's the master? Who's the slave? Now, is there something to that? I would say, sure, that's, that's one way we might look at human society. But there tends to be a reduction in, in the woke movement to that, you know. And also the questioning of an objective human nature that draws us together. What I much prefer, as you say correctly, in classical liberalism is that the appeal to our common humanity, an appeal to common moral values and a common human nature that brings us together. And on that basis, we can move toward greater and greater justice. Now, that's the language of Martin Luther King. And I'm a great advocate of King's. What we're dealing with today is something very different. It's, it's a different philosophical framework, and I think a much um, worse one. Okay, so Bishop Barron says there are concerns with wokeism. Later on, he gave a couple of them. First, he says it advocates a deeply antagonistic social theory, whereby the world is divided sharply into two classes. There are only two classes, the oppressed and the oppressors. You are either one or the other. The thing is, in reality, most of us don't fit either. I consider myself definitely not oppressed. And other than cameraman Giuseppe, I don't think anybody considers me an oppressor. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so um, this is something to be aware of. Second, they see classical morality as an attempt by the ruling class to maintain power. Well, somebody's got to lead. Okay, third, he says woke focus is not on individuals, 
but on racial and ethnic categories, and hence they endorse an idea of collective guilt. You know, I hear this term all the time, guilt. First of all, because I'm Catholic. Catholic guilt, Catholic guilt, Catholic guilt. No, it's called repentance. Catholic guilt is not guilt, it's repentance. It's sorrow for our sins, but then to get better. And so here, they said they force a collective guilt and a sort of reverse discrimination to address past injuries. Fourth, woke tends to demonize the market economy and the institutions of democracy as part of a superstructure only to defend the privileged. Well, if we keep saying that, how are wounds ever going to heal? And so he says this is a problem. So once awakened to this reality, woke, they created confrontation between the powerless and the powerful. And here we see the influence of Marxism and class warfare. Bishop Barron just said that. Catholic social teaching, which is what I'm giving you today, not politics. Catholic social teaching stands against all of this. It wants social justice, but not on woke terms. This is important. Its heroes are not Marx or Nietzsche, but rather the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Jeremiah, Jesus, St. Thomas Aquinas, or in the streets, Mother Teresa. Bishop Barron said, I fear that a lot of Catholics legitimately concerned about social injustice and eager to some do something about it will turn not to our biblically based and deeply wise tradition of the church, but rather to a philosophy that's currently in the culture. This nails it. So he says this woke philosophy, which holds to an antagonistic social theory, which deconstructs language. We're reinventing language now. Do you know our students don't even know how to spell? Words have been perfectly cha uh, permanently changed. You're now, instead of Y-O-U-R or a possessive Y-O-U apostrophe R, it's just you are. You know, these are, we're permanently in the personal pronouns. And he says this. He says, what is happening? He says, we're deconstructing language, denying moral norms, and seeing reality only as a struggle between oppressor and oppressed. He says, this is not the answer. I couldn't agree more. But the church isn't perfect in this. The absence of religious leadership. There is a famous picture online of a bishop in Texas that was joining the riots and protests, kneeling and protesting. A certain movement of a certain group whose manifesto teaches five things. It's not a secret. You can go to their website and see it. This particular group, BLM, teaches abortion, transgenderism, gay marriage, destruction of the patriarchy, and Marxist principles. All five condemned by the Catholic Church. What in the world are our bishops doing supporting that? It's crazy. And so we have to understand what the church teaches and why. And so this is very important. The absence of religious leadership in all of these protests and indeed the hostility to religion that we're seeing everywhere is showing a major shift in culture. You know, I just saw a video yesterday. I, I, I couldn't believe it. There was a street preacher, an evangelical fundamentalist. Now, I didn't necessarily agree with the method he was using. He was... He was out on his soapbox, but his message 
was beautiful because it was the Scripture. So he was yelling, repent, just like John the Baptist. We just celebrated John the Baptist. Repent. You know, Christ is coming. Leave sin. Turn to God. The message was, it was scriptural. And there's a video of a seven-year-old girl going up to him on the street. He basically ignored her. And she's screaming profanity at him. And they had this on video. What shocked me the most was the comments supporting this seven-year-old girl. If I talked to anybody that way when I was seven, let alone a preacher, I'd have a permanent handprint. I'm not advocating, you know, um, harsh discipline. My father never harshly disciplined me. But for our society to con not only allow such a thing, but to condone it is shocking. What have we become? When this man wasn't hurting anybody, he's preaching the word of God. He's just hoping people could hear him. And she's in his face, seven years old, screaming profanities at him, and people are cheering her on. We have, I, I don't even know what to say about something like that other than we need prayers. We need prayers. The philosophy of woke is not classical liberalism. I'm not here to bash the liberal agenda because actually what I've learned is woke is actually not in line with the classical liberal agenda, believe it or not. Actually, it's a rather more dangerous postmodernism. What is that? What is postmodernism? Postmodernism is where you put your feelings over reason, your experience over reality, subjectivity over objectivity, feelings, emotions over the truth. That is the most dangerous. Let's go to our next slide. This is Frederick Nietzsche. He asserts he was an atheist. He preached the non-existence of God and hence the relativity of any claim to objective truth or moral truth. This is moral relativism. I remember, <clears throat> you've heard me tell the story, I was teaching a confirmation class in Boston, 10th graders, and I, the topic of my talk wasn't even about marriage between a man and a woman. It just happened to come up as a tangent in one of my talks. And here comes after my talk a posse of 10th grade girls. And they said, how dare you force your truth on us? I'm like, it's not my truth. I mean, it is my truth. But this isn't my opinion. I mean, it is my opinion. <laughs> how, do I, how do I say that? Um, it's God's. This is the truth. You can't change the truth. And she said, how dare some gray-haired old man in Rome tell me what I can do in my bedroom? And again, I can't say anything. I wouldn't be a priest today. But I'm thinking, what? you're in 10th grade. What are we talking about what is happening in your bedroom? You're in 10th grade. You're 15 years old. I was surprised. But basically, don't give me your truth. I have my truth. This is the biggest problem today. This moral relativism. But here, the biblical person can find common ground. Beginning with the prophets, Jesus himself going right into our Christian Catholic tradition, we can find the conviction that seeking justice, which we all want, is congruent with the will of God, with the Gospels. It's not just politics. I'm up here because I want to see social justice, but congruent with the Word of God, not politics. I'm not endorsing a political party or a political candidate. 
So please, save the letter to my bishop. I'm here to preach the truth. Now, however, the conversation between the religious and the revolutionary, which is where we're at right now, is tougher today than it's ever been, maybe even at least in the last 60 years, for the current society is more atheistic now than ever. So if you're gonna to try to use the word of God as that basis of natural law, natural truth, we're having a tougher time. But the bishop tells Christians not to give up because the love of justice can be the bridge. Now, social justice is church teaching. It's not political, as I said. And there's a good article called Social Justice Isn't Left or Right. This is by Leon Suprenet in Catholic Answers. Very good. Let me give you a few things here. Social justice, which the church teaches, seems to be a lightning rod today that divides us Catholics. It touches upon things that matter to everybody, politics, economics, world peace, climate, race, religion. There's bound to be some disagreement. But what is social justice and we as Catholics? Social justice is an integral part of our teaching. Again, what everybody accuses me of teaching politics is social justice. It's based on the rights that flow from human dignity, the human being that we were given. And it inclines us to work with others to help make social institutions serve the common good. Not just specific goods for certain people, but the common good. Very important. The church's social doctrine is rooted in scripture. And it's especially drawing upon the church's encyclicals over the last hundred years. My favorite pope in the world, you know, is Leo XIII. The very first encyclical that I read in seminary was Rerum Novarum, 1891. And it talked about the importance of private property and condemned Marxism. You think I'm teaching politics? Read the church teachings for a hundred years. For Catholics, we follow the natural law. That's part of being a human being. God puts on every heart what's right or wrong. We fully believe that the church champions the natural law, possesses the wisdom on major social issues today. She has the answers, but we're not listening to her. Let's go to our next slide. Yes, it's true though, Catholics are not the only ones using the term social justice, right? There's a slide from Northern Colorado University, and I'm sure that's not based on Catholic teaching. So, many use the term. It's become a code word used by some for a libertine moral agenda. Now, what is libertine? I'm not saying liberal. Libertine moral agenda. This is lacking moral principles. Because you can't tell me what to do. I don't want you telling me what to do. Even though it's not me, it's God. And it's coupled with an economic agenda that is mostly socialist. Many people are looking for solutions today without any reference to God or heaven. This is our problem. So again, we have to look at this, the principles, not the politics. All right, what's the best place for a Catholic to go to learn social teaching of the church? For all of you, and I say this with a smile, that say to me, Father, stop teaching politics. I want you to look at the next slide. Here's the next slide. The great place to start is the compendium of the social doctrine of the Catholic Church. Yes, the church gets involved in politics. The compendium has many sections on human dignity, family, work, peace, economics, and politics. Interesting. I've never talked about this before in any of my talks. Usually we just get into a bartering match where you send comments, stop being political, and I send comments back saying, as a Catholic priest, I'm supposed to be involved in the cultural politics. Well, you know what? I waive that and I go right to this book. <laughs> All of it is examined in light of Catholic teaching, church teaching. Now, social justice then, can be two things. 
Social justice can be Catholic teaching or it could be a political buzzword. The two things are blended. They're similar, but they cause confusion. <coughs> and this is the problem. They are now twisted. You want to see how social justice has been twisted from the church teaching and people use against us? How the terms are misused? Listen to this. When you hear the term human rights, what do you think? A good thing, right? Human rights belong to each and every person. This is church teaching by virtue of his being created in the image and likeness of God upon the natural law. So the church teaches human rights come from God to do what's right. Now, in the political or the culture, they assert that such things, such rights and dignities are determined by the state and the will of the people. No. Your human rights are determined by God. You cannot determine by a vote that I have a right to take a life inside the womb. That right is God alone to take that life. So human rights in the way of the church is rights given to humans by God. Human rights in the secular world now mean I am God. I have the right to take that life in my womb. What about freedom? What does that mean to you? Freedom is a good thing. It reaches its perfection in seeking what is true and good, which ultimately leads to God, truth and goodness. Now in the culture, we define freedom as license. Do whatever one feels like doing, as long as it's not illegal. Now even what's illegal has seemed okay without regard to truth, goodness, or God. Don't take away my right to take that life. You're taking away my freedom. No, freedom is not the ability to do whatever you want. Freedom is the ability to do what you ought to do. What about truth, my favorite topic? Truth should say to you, this is good. It involves correspondence to objective reality. God is truth itself. Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Some now in culture, in the society, claim that truth is merely a, rel merely a relative term. They can vary from person to person. This is preposterous. In the process, they deny any objective moral truth. Don't tell me what I can't do. If I want to sleep with everybody in the town of Des Moines, Iowa, I can. There's nothing wrong with that. That's my choice. No, it's not the truth of God. What about the common good? We hear that term all the time. The church teaches that it refers to the good of the entire community as the proper object of a just law. And nonetheless presupposes respect for the individual. This is Catechism of 1907. Now in our culture, we equate the common good and the promotion of the common good to the redistribution of wealth, taking from those who worked hard to give to those who don't want to, entitlement programs, stripping of individual freedoms, and the right not to have to be told medically what I have to do. You know, the funny thing that Bishop uh, Cordelione said in our interview with him was my choice, my body, applied during abortion, but as soon as it came to the vaccine, no longer applied. Kind of interesting, isn't it? And finally, the culture of life. Interesting. For Catholics, this refers to all life, but it does hone in on abortion and euthanasia because that's a key. But some now use the term life or culture of life for women's rights because I need health care. And taking a life in the womb and abortion is not health care. But they'll call it that to give credence to their, their positions, even though they're promoting the culture of death. Now let's weigh in what the church has said on this. Let's go to our next slide. Pope Francis, even Pope Francis, 
expressed deep concern over cancel culture. Surprisingly, the increasingly prevalent practice of silencing individuals, institutions, and even, the Pope said, entire cultures that are determined to hold incorrect or inconvenient views or values of others is shut down. Pope Francis criticized this. He says it's wrong. And this Pope Francis has given a voice to the growing number of Catholic leaders. Thank God we have priests out there. Father Don Calloway, or what I call my GPS, Father Mark Goring, Father Mitch Pacwa, Father Spitzer, GPS, Goring, Pacwa, Spitzer. Those are the guys I go to. Father Bill Casey from the Fathers of Mercy. These are the ones standing up for the truth. And so now, Francis has even given a voice to support that. These Catholic leaders have been screaming fear that the cancel culture's relativism and immoral views will go against the truth of Catholic teaching. And we're getting canceled. How many Catholic priests have been canceled? I know my time is coming. I will get canceled. But I pray somehow I'll get the message out far enough before it happens. I've always said, I knew God gave me a big mouth. <laughs> and I said, okay, Lord, I'm planning on getting married, running a business, having a home, a boat, and a dog, and a beautiful wife. But if you're asking me to give that up, and I will, you must have a plan for me. You're not just going to make me do that, you know, just uh, randomly. You're going to ask me to do that for a reason. And I believe the reason is I got a big mouth. So you might as well use that big mouth for God. That's how I'm trying to use my big mouth. I have to just trust in the rest. So the Pope continued, under the guise of defending diversity, it risks silencing balanced and respectful positions. A kind of dangerous one-track thinking is taking shape. This is Pope Francis. A kind of dangerous one-track thinking is taking shape, one that denies history, or worse, rewrites history. Whoa! Whoa! in terms of present-day categories. Whereas any historical situation must be interpreted in light of that particular time, not in light of today. It's kind of like slavery. Nobody today is going to deny slavery is wrong. Nobody. But do you know that the first slaves in America were the Irish? Not the African Americans. Irish slaves, white. Do you know the word slave where it comes from? The word slave comes from the word Slav. I'm Slav. I'm 100% Slav. I'm Croatian on my dad's side. I'm Czech on my mom's side. The word slave comes from Slav because they were the most enslaved people in the known world at the time. All I'm saying is that we got to be careful. I saw a dorm room changed at a university, and the whole wing in the dorm was changed because it was found out that the man it was named after, his brother, owned slaves. Not even him. And so, he's been canceled. The one that broke my heart was St. Louis. I just watched a video this morning of them trying to tear down the statue of St. Louis the Ninth, Louis the Ninth, one of the top five greatest saints in the history of the church. And they were tearing it down, and this young priest grabs a microphone, he says, why are you trying to destroy St. Louis? And they said, because of his oppression. He says, what oppression? 
He was one of the most benevolent kings in the history of the world. He gave his own food to the poor. He fed them before he ate himself. He gave land to the peasants. And they said, well, he attacked the slave trade. He fostered the slave trade. He said, he lived before the slave trade, the African-American slave trade. And so they're ready to tear down a statue. They don't know history. And yet now we're rewriting it. Another one that surprised a lot of people, let's go to our next slide. The Archbishop of Los Angeles, Jose Gomez, gets a lot of flack, deservedly so in some sense, but listen to what he said. Today's critical theories and ideologies are atheistic. <clears throat> An integral part of the agenda is diversity, equity, and inclusion mandates, but they end up discriminating against members of groups that have not been determined to be oppressed or underrepresented. Underrepresented. In other words, what he's saying is in the name of DEI, we're discriminating against other groups just because they've not been deemed the oppressed. White privilege is an example of is what he said now, am I saying that there isn't times that those have to be addressed? Of course there are. There are singular cases all over the place, and they got to be addressed. We're not doubting that. But Archbishop Gomez, and here I'm just reading their words, said that the secular movements promoting social justice and wokeness are pseudo-religions that should be understood as replacements to Christian beliefs. We're trying to get rid of Christianity so no rules apply. Do whatever you want. Can you believe now the UN is trying to state that sexual relations with minors is okay? Is this insanity? Th this is insane. It's, it's trying to replace Christian moral root that the world and the Western world was found on. So we got to get rid of the Western world and then get rid of the church. Western world, because of its freedom, we got to have one world government. We can't have the United States standing in the way. And we got to get rid of the church. We can't have any morals telling us that what we do is wrong. We don't profess our loyalty to God. We profess it to the state. This is basically what Gomez is saying, which is in line with what I read in my view of the agenda. Archbishop Gomez said, today's critical theories deny the soul, the spiritual dimension of human nature, and think that it is irrelevant to human happiness. Really? They reduce what it means to be human to essential physical qualities. All it sees as human is not the soul, but the color of your skin, your genitalia, your notion of gender, or your ethnic, ethnic background. As Thomas Aquinas says, those are accidents, not meaning they're mistakes. They're not core. I can change my hair color. That doesn't change who I am as a person. I could even change the pigment of my skin to be darker or lighter, that doesn't change who I am as a person. But yet that's who culture is defining as your identity and genitalia. We're going to be talking about this more in a, another talk, but where you put your genitals is now defined who you are as a person. That is so against church teaching. It's not, it's, 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 it's a, a reality, a, a dysphoria, if anything. So Archbishop Gomez, and he himself is a minority. He's Hispanic. He critiqued critical race theory, saying it is based on the premise that race is a socially constructed category that leads only to oppression of minorities. He's a minority. And he's critiquing this. He said, critical race theory's errors in things such as hiring quotas based only on skin color, which 
he says stood against Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King said, don't hire me based on my skin color. Hire me based on my quality. Employment practices should be based on qualifications, he said. And justice system reforms are now taking away the penalties for members of certain races or ethnic groups because there seems to be more of them in the prisons. So we're waiving the personal responsibility of an individual just because of the numbers of their group in the prison, but it totally neglects, he said, the social factors that may have led to that. I think this is very important. He goes on to say, critical race theory and wokeness are intrinsically anti-Christian. So before you condemn your priest, condemn the catechism, condemn me, condemn Father Calloway, Father Mark Goring, Father Spitzer, Father Pacwa, or Father Bill Casey, you might want to hear what Archbishop Gomez is saying. Now, Dr. Denise Donahue actually said that wokeness is intrinsically anti-Christian. She's a representative of the Cardinal Newman Society. They promote and defend the Catholic faith in education. First, critical race theory has a very narrow focus, she said in an interview with BC Catholic and British Columbia. She said it premises everything on race and addresses the question of who should benefit and who should not. But the first principle of Catholic social teaching is the dignity of all people. It is race neutral. It's not based on your race. It teaches that we are all children of God, no matter what we look like. She said we all have individual dignity. We can't cancel anyone. CRT opposes a person's dignity by automatically and unfairly making them biased based on their skin color alone. We're being told that we're racist because of our skin color. It's an irony. And she said that CRT is atheistic and leaves no room for the creator-creature relationship. To them, there is no transcendence or reliance upon anything higher than oneself. This is dangerous. God is higher than us. This leads to atheism and runs counter to the Christian mind. Wokeism shows influences of Marxism, materialism, and relativism. These elements must be called out and must be examined or we could lose our soul. Do you think that's why the Catholic Church is screaming to be aware of this? As a priest, I'm responsible for your soul. As a priest, I am responsible to bring souls to God. Now, I'm not responsible in the sense that I judge or anything like that. No, 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 no. But a Catholic priest is responsible to bring souls to God through the truth and love. Father Kaz does it through love. I do it through the truth. <laughs> but we have to do both. We have to do both. Finally, Father Gomez or Bishop Gomez said there are problems with critical theories because of their militant atheism. They can't perceive the image of God in all of our neighbors. They foster division. In denying God, these new movements have lost the truth about the human person. This explains their extremism and their harsh, uncompromising, and unforgiving approach to politics causing new forms of social division, discrimination, intolerance, and injustice. Wow. Has anybody, have anybody ever told you this stuff? Are we teaching this in the schools? And you know what? Even if we don't teach it in the schools, are we at least teaching it in the Catholic schools? No. Are we teaching it in the Catholic churches? No. Stay awake, even if you are not woke. The heart of this is a spiritual battle. Let's go to our next slide. In her book, Awake, Not Woke, 
a Christian response to the cult of progressive ideology. There's a woman named Noelle Mehring, and she argues that the woke movement is a surrender to take the place of God. It is also the direct consequence, she said, of the sexual revolution, which is interesting. One of the reasons woke ideology has been successful in Christian communities, she said, is it feeds off the Christian precept of compassion and helping the marginalized and the suffering. That makes perfect sense, doesn't it? She said this leads to a lot of confusion about whether or not Christians can be woke with many seeing as the natural outgrowth of Christian charity. So it seems on the surface it could be good. But she said, no, it harms more than it helps. It is imperative we identify how it operates. That's why I'm here, trying to help you understand that. She said it can mimic Christianity. Isn't that the devil? The devil wants to take something and show you, hey, this is good. It's really good that you do this. It's better that you squash on that person at work because you'd be a better manager. It's really good that you move in with your girlfriend before you get married. That way you can test drive the car before you buy it. That's the devil. But he's going to make it look good. This causes confusion. Even as society grows more secular, the woke movement seems to sense that it can grow like a parasite off the, the, this residue of religion until it finally replaces it. This seems to be the whole goal. The Catholic Church defines a human person in relation to God. We are universally brothers and sisters. We have a common humanity, whereas... We are supposed to see everything as signs and shadows of God's goodness, all right? However, they are called to see everything as signs of oppression and power. Woke defines the human person not in relationship to God, but to the hatred of man and society. So this becomes this negative filter through which woke views the world. It prevents you from seeing the big picture and God's involvement, from truly being awake. So the name is completely a misnomer. And so to wrap this up, she was interviewed on Catholic Answers by Cy Kellett. And I want to read you a few things for this. I think it's very interesting. Cy said to her, we have terms like privileged, certainly by your race, which can be used as a tool to dismiss you. You're dismissed. And if you want to share Jesus, well, there's a certain white privilege that comes with that. And really that's just because of some kind of imperialistic colonist, colonist attempt to impose your values on someone else your values from the outside that are not intrinsic to my culture. Basically saying, there's no good news here. And Noel answered, suffering is a part of the human condition. We are all suffering, but in different ways. Just because I haven't suffered in the same way you have doesn't make me a racist. There is a balance where we are called to walk with people truly in their suffering, but we can't accept the idea, we cannot accept the idea that there is access to the, some kind of truth that is only understood by people based on some characteristics such as skin color, genitalia, or the way they define their gender. That doesn't make you have access to the truth in a way I don't have access to. The truth is the truth. You're not privileged over me or I'm not privileged over you because I did not have a sex change, but you did or vice versa. She said what many people mean by tolerance is the acceptance of everyone's belief is equal and valid. This is wrong. 
All right, this is probably where I'm going to get canceled. Tolerance, she said, when people say tolerance is the acceptance of everyone's beliefs as equal and valid, is wrong. If all beliefs are equal and valid, there cannot be an absolute truth. There's only one truth. This is why you can't have 40,000 different Christian religions. There cannot be 40,000 different truths. There's only one truth. So which one is it? Well, I'm going to put my bet on the one that was started by Jesus Christ and the only Catholic Christian religion that existed for 1,500 years until Martin Luther. That's the one I'm going to put my bet on. She said here, this is the problem. If all beliefs are equal and valid, there can be no absolute truth. There can be no objective truth if all beliefs are just as good as the other. Man, we're not teaching this in our schools. Therefore, when decoded, thou shalt not be intolerant, this is nothing more than masked relativism. Now, if by tolerance we're simply meaning that we ought to not force people into our beliefs or torture them into our beliefs or alienate them because they don't believe what we do, no, that's fine. That's good. We have no qualms with that, she said. But most of those who tout the wokeism view of moral absolute don't have this kind of tolerance in mind. Lifestyle changes can be equally permissible only if there is no objective truth about such choices. Did you hear that? They want to make all lifestyle choices equal. And that can only happen if there's no objective truth. How are we going to survive if we have no objective moral truth? What is right and what is wrong? And if there's no objective truth about lifestyle choices, then there's no such thing as any morality. And society will collapse. That's what we're seeing, everybody. Basically, we are told we are forcing our religion upon others as Catholics, when in fact, we just want to practice it. And the same way I can say to you, don't force me to have to condone your practices. Love the sinner, hate the sin. So we're wrapping up here. Dr. Edward Fesser said, woke uses negative filtering insofar as it arbitrarily defines terms like racism, sexism, transphobia, homophobia, etc. So broadly, they, 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 they define it so broadly that anything Anything can be made out to be racist, sexist, transphobic, or homophobic. Even what would have been historically been seen as not racist, colorblind. Just because I teach against transgender ideology doesn't mean I'm afraid of transgender people. If I teach against transgender for children and genital mutilation for little kids, if I preach against that, I've been called transphobic or trans, yeah, transphobia. Well, just because I try to protect children and say that it's wrong to mutilate their genitals doesn't mean I'm afraid of transgender people. We love them. We embrace them. We sit with them. We eat with them. We worship with them. We talk with them. We love them. Just because I preach against the activity doesn't mean I have a phobia against the person. This is a lie. Wokeism engages in labeling. How? By ignoring all the complex causes that there are for disparities and simply calling it racist or sexist. For example, the link between prison populations. Everybody wants to point that the percentage in prisons is higher in the African community, American community, so it must be racist. You know what they found? They have proven a direct link in the prison population is not race. 
It's fatherhood. It's fatherhood. The percentage of people, white or black, it's about the same, that grew up in a home with a present father was so low in the prison population, didn't matter if they were black or white, And the percentage of those black or white that grew up without a father, no father, not being present, was astronomically high as a percentage in the prison population. So instead of just screaming racism, we should be screaming what's happening to the family. Now, if there is racism cases, and I'm sure, and I know there are, I'm not saying we ignore those, but of course not. But if you go by the pure numbers, the problem is fatherhood. White or black. Doesn't matter, it's the same for both. You grow up with a father that, that loves and disciplines lovingly, you're going to grow up in a much better percentage of not being in prison than if you grow up without a father. I, I know that's true for me. I'm blessed. I, am I sitting here condemning anybody? Heck no. I thank God every day that I grew up in a home with a father. At the time, I didn't like it. I was the only kid I ever knew in my life that was using a push blade gas powered mower in kindergarten <laughs> my dad had me mowing that you should have seen the line it went like this but i got that lawn mowed i was in kindergarten on saturdays there was no laying around and watching tv and cartoons in the winter we were out cutting wood because we had a wood burning stove but at the same time my father was present he taught that i respected my mother even though I didn't always do that. He taught that you were fair, honest, loving to others, and most of all, you went to church. Without a father, where would I be? I don't know. I have the ultimate empathy for those who are, have grown up without fathers. God bless them, but while it may be race that somebody's in prison or not, I, I think fatherhood is where we're not looking. And so we need to do that. And so wokeism also promotes a dichotomy, a dichotomous thinking insofar as that it insists that one either agrees with the woke ideas or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, it's to be dismissed as racist, transphobic, homophobic, sexist, etc. We are afraid of the cancel culture. So we don't say anything. Wokeism also is ca catastrophizing in the sense that it insists that everything short of implementing the most extreme woke policies will leave us with an unjust society and therefore, we have made little progress. In other words, all or none. Finally, it claims mind reading by imputing bigotry, hate to all critics, even without any evidence or proof. And there is one more, overgeneralizing by treating any particular case of a real life injustice as if it were confirmation of the entire woke agenda, such as shooters. A shooter may have had a bad intention. I, I know for a fact that there has been racist shooters. There was one in Buffalo. That should be condemned, but that doesn't make everyone. In fact, there was one who went after Christians in Tennessee and shot up a Christian school. So now should the Christians stand up and say every single person is anti-Christian. This is what we got to look at. So anyway, finally, public support. Is wokeism 
supported by the public. Parts of it, like gender, race, immigration, transgenderism, really don't seem to have public support, surprisingly. When I was in Australia, I was told by the Australians that, gee, all Americans are all in favor of all this. Actually, a poll showed that despite debates in many communities over things like CRT, critical race theory, being taught in school, a quarter of Americans, only a quarter, are in favor of teaching it. Another research, Pew Research, showed 73% of Americans say college admission should not be based on race, but qualification. Another Pew study says 68% of Americans disprove of the current administration's handling of the border. One thing is clear about the trend that has dominated much of our schools, our media, and our corporations. It doesn't come from public support. This is what's very fascinating. So where does it come from? Well, this Victor Hansen had a good answer. He said, unlike the revolutions of the 60s, which people were protesting outside the corporation, or outside the New York Times, or outside Hollywood offices, these people are now on the inside. Let's go to our next slide. They run Hollywood. They run the NBA. They run Major League Baseball. They run the NFL. They run Wall Street. They run Silicon Valley. They run the universities. They run the media. So that's what explains why the agenda has had very little popular support but continues to thrive, he said. The mainstream uh, media buys fully into this ideology and you can't really count on to get a fair report. Now back to the woke agenda that I started with. I'd like to read a quote that he gave and we're gonna finish then a quick summary. Mr. Hansen said, the real orchestrators, the elites who know exactly what they're doing by insisting on woke textbooks for kids and encouraging an upside down morality, it's part of an overall plan to disrupt, influence, and indoctrinate our children so as to change our country, thus revolutionizing our future. Community disorganization is the first step in community reorganization, a one world government which is biblical. By separating children from the negative influence of their parents, disrupting society's present moral structure, which also the Bible says, in the end, what is good will call be bad, what is bad will be called good. Basically, everything we're reading here, everything I said, this is scriptural. By disrupting society's present moral structure and systematically displacing Judeo-Christian values, this movement is unleashing social chaos. Can anyone here honestly say it's not creating chaos? Even if the intent is good, the means is what Pope Francis and Archbishop Gomez said are not. The chaos is to create a void that their new social order will quickly fill. What can we do to save our children from this moral kidnapping and our nation from this cultural hijacking? Now we get to the crux. Our forefathers had the answer. They offered a culture-preserving advice from the Bible. The answer, train your children in the way they should go. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, honor your husbands. Love God and love one another sincerely from the heart. 
Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Honor one another above yourselves. Don't be lazy, work hard. Rejoice in hope, be patient in trial, and keep on praying. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. That's not my manifesto, even though it really is. That's Proverbs 22.6, Ephesians 5.25, and Romans 12.9. So to summarize, woke ideology may have many in it with good intent. If you are watching and you're angry at me right now, I yield to that. I am not going to argue that you may be fully in support of it and you may have awesome intent. I am not going to dispute that. Many, I'm sure, do. However, nobody can argue it's not causing division. That's the first principle of Marxism, cause division. Stoking anger and resentment at those in charge. Resentment serves well to lead to revolution. But it also obscures our understanding of God, mercy, and love. We reduce him to a harsh taskmaster master, rather than a loving father. Or worse, we totally eliminate him. While we can hide for some time from ourselves, we cannot hide from God. He already knows what we are, who we are what is good and what is bad. The bad news is, he knows our sins. The good news is, that means we get his mercy. His love for us is far greater than we've ever can fathom. In knowing our need, God comes to reveal to us the depth of his love and mercy. You know, I got an email from a friend. You've heard me talk about the whole Leo Leo the 13th when he overheard the conversation between Christ and Satan. And Satan said, I can bring down your church. And Jesus said, you think so? And Satan said, yes, but I need more time and I need more power. And when Christ asked him how much time, Satan said about 100 years. Now what's interesting is God allowed it. Jesus allowed that 100 years of Satan, and I believe the reason why is so we could see our misery when we're in the hands of the evil one rather in the hands of a merciful God. And the only answer to misery, let's look at our next slide, is mercy. That's it. He's waiting for us if we only turn to him. So what do we do, Father? Get involved. Get involved in your community, at work, especially at school. You have rights. Don't be afraid to mention the name Jesus. You have every right to mention it anywhere at any time. Somebody tries to tell you you can't mention the word of Jesus, contact the Thomas More Legal Society. It's a lie. The devil always overplays his hand. And you know what I think? He overplayed it with woke. Woke had a good thing going. The tide is now changing. You know why I think the tide is changing? They brought in children. When you bring in children, it's going to happen. It's going to be exposed. And I think that's where the devil overplayed his hand. We have to protect them. The tide, I think, is turning. We see that with Bud Light and the Los Angeles Dodgers, now even Target. I walked into Target about five years ago. I've never went back in. What I saw there was beyond shocking. The shirts there blatantly anti-moral. 
And I'm learning now that the key person hired at Target to design those shirts is a proclaimed Satanist. What in the world? And so we will continue to trust. We will continue to fight the good fight. Now, I am done with this talk on what woke is, and I'm sorry, it was a little academic, but I invite you to stay with me, because the next several talks, other than the first Saturday talk, because it's always on Our Lady, but the following ones, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about, and this is where we're going to get into the really pragmatic or practical teaching of the church and things you all been asking me. I apologize because what I talked about today wasn't really what you guys were asking for. Okay. We're going to talk about pride and what church teaching is, transgenderism and what church teaching is, and the rest of the elements of woke, if it's Christian or not, as we said, BLM, defunding the police, anti-patriotism, removal of God, climate change, cancel culture, and equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Remember, church teaching has an answer to all of this. And we hope you'll join us because this is probably the most critical cultural time in our history. And the only answer is God. And so we're grateful that you're with us. We invite you back as we touch on those other subjects down the road. Until then, the only answer is prayer. Activism, yes, we got to get involved in our school boards and, and whatnot, stand up for the truth. But the best is prayer. And so we ask you, if Brother Mark can show our next slide, become part of our Marian family. MICprayers.org. Please visit. Become part of our Marian family. I don't care if you ever donate. Doesn't take but 20 seconds. Doesn't cost any money. Just become part of our Marian family. We pray for you. You pray for us. Jesus said that's the way to go. And finally, if you've seen some of our talks, we've got our Explaining the Faith DVD. You can get it at shopmercy.org. Or if Mark can flip the screen, Understanding Divine Mercy, my book about what divine mercy is, also at shopmercy.org. And finally, suicideandhope.com if you're suffering, not just from suicide, but any kind of suffering or loss. This book will help. Well, God bless all of you for joining us, and we hope that you'll continue this journey to understanding our faith and what the Catholic Church teaches a little better in this incredibly pervasive social and cultural issue. And until then, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. The talk is ended. Thanks be to God. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.